Welcome to Heart of the Matter. I'm Sean McCraney. Uh, this is a live call-in show. Let's begin, if we can, with a word of prayer. It always helps all of us, doesn't it? Heavenly Father, we love you, Lord. We thank you, Lord, for life and for this opportunity. We thank you for the blessings that you pour out upon us, Lord, and we're so grateful for having you in our lives. And we pray that you will be with us now. Help me as the host of this show that I'll be able to be kind and deliver a message that you would want me to deliver, that our interaction with callers, whether they be Christian or LDS, would be loving and kind, and it will move people toward you. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Last week, a caller named Steve said, the difference, this is a quote, the difference between the LDS church and being, born, being a born-again Christian is that we, meaning LDS, do not believe that Christ comes into your heart and does not do all the hard work. I was so happy uh, Steve called and said that on the air because it encapsulates one of the essential differences between Mormonism and Christianity. One focuses on religious allegiance and the other focuses on a relationship with Jesus Christ. If you were going to title this show today, it would be Religion or Relationship. And we're going to talk about that briefly. To begin with, Christians believe that, that Jesus does dwell in them. That is a biblical tenet. Now, that's never spoke about or talked about in the LDS Church. But let me read you a few scriptures. John 14, 18 through 20. This is Jesus talking. I will not leave you, orphans. I will come to you. Yet a little while, and the world does not see me anymore. But you see me, because I live, you shall live also. At that day you shall know that I am in my Father, and you in me, and I in you. Jesus talking. Galatians 2.20 I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live. Yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. Did you hear that? Christ liveth in me, and the life which I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God, who loved me and gave himself for me. Ephesians 3.17 That Christ may dwell in your hearts by faith, that ye being rooted and grounded in love. And Revelation 3.20 Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If any man hear my voice and open the door, I will come into him and will sup with him and he with me. Latter-day Saints do not speak of Jesus dwelling in them, as Steve so boldly proclaimed. They talk of having the Spirit which is not absorbed as the same thing as having Jesus dwell in them. What does the difference really mean theologically? Does it mean any difference at all? Are these only semantics? Do they have any, any bearing on how people really feel and think and act? They do. And because the mindset is so different between what Christians believe and what Latter-day Saints believe, the end result is enormously different. Our caller Steve also said that the LDS do not believe that Jesus does the hard work. They, another truism about Mormonism, they believe that they do the hard work. They put the shoulder to the wheel and they push along. But nothing could be more contrary in an exegetical analysis of the Bible. Let me read two scriptures. Now listen carefully. Philippians 3.9 And be found in him not having mine own righteousness, which is of the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. Listen, 1 Corinthians 1, 27, 31 But God has chosen the foolish things of the world to confound the wise, and God has chosen the weak things of the world to confound the things which are mighty. And God has chosen the base things of the world and the things which are despised and the things which are not in order to bring nothing, to, in order to bring nothing things that are 
so that no flesh should glory in his presence. But of him you are in Christ Jesus, who of God is made to us wisdom. So Christ Jesus is made to us wisdom, righteousness, sanctification, and redemption. So that according as it is written, he who glories, let him glory in the Lord. All glory is in the Lord. We do no thing. All work is from him. He does it. All strength is by him, not our flesh. All love is through him, not ourselves. If the atonement of Jesus Christ, uh, meaning the suffering for sin, was all that was needed to accomplish uh, his mission, Jesus could have come down as a grown adult and he could have made the required payment for sin and suffered on the cross and died and the world could have come sinless before the Father. But we would have presented ourselves in a net zero gain. We would have presented ourselves as clean but not profitable. We would have been just blank. We would be justified, not sanctified. We would be clean, but totally unprofitable. Now, Latter-day Saints would say, well, the righteousness we do of ourselves will please God. How does a soiled creation who has sinned, and Latter-day Saints, you all believe you have sinned in some way, please a perfect and holy God? By what means do we do this? Hebrews 11.6 says, without faith, it is impossible to please God. No matter what, it's impossible without faith to please God. And 1 Corinthians 1.29 says, it tells us that no flesh can glory in his presence. So our works, as the scriptures also say, are but filthy rags to him. It is our faith that justifies us and sanctifies us before the Father. Jesus' righteousness that he got from living a perfect life is imputed to us as we believe on him. That imputation of righteousness makes us profitable before the Lord. Our faith in his Son pleases God, not the works of the flesh, Steve. Our faith is in his Son and our faith in him justifying us. Our faith in him sanctifying us. You see, my LDS friends... Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by Him. Not by our works, not by our doing our things, not by our doing the hard work ourselves. It's by Him. He justified us before the Father. He sanctified us before the Father. Our faith is what pleases God. And when we stand before the Father, He's going to view us through the blood and righteousness of his son. That's how he will see us. And he's going to say, did they have faith? Did they have belief and faith in my son? They are not going to say, what do you bring to the altar, brother or sister, to prove to me that you're righteous and worthy? That's not true, and it's a lie. And the scriptures are replete with examples for that. Now, some Latter-day Saints will go and say, well, Philippians 2.12 says, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. Brethren and sisters, read the next verse. Just read the next verse. It says, For it is God which worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. It's God in you that does that work of salvation through you. It's not you. These simple scriptures pulled out of context and used to prove points does not take the word of God as a whole and they, and they establish a faulty theology. I'm not sure Latter-day Saints hear this. Why? Because Mormonism presents typically an altogether different gospel. I want to read to you from a, a member of the church, Bushman, uh, who writes about what was established by Joseph Smith regarding your gospel and how it works. Listen carefully. Page 314 of Rough Stone Rolling. Joseph's method for bringing his people to holiness differed from the approach of evangelical preachers. Rather than convincing people of their sins, thus humbling them before God, Joseph relied on the power of ritual 
to arouse their spirits. The saints did not have to admit their helplessness as a first step toward reaching Christ. They were washed, anointed, and blessed, ministered to, rather than upbraided, a more liturgical than evangelical method. W.W. Phelps wrote to his wife, We are preparing to make ourselves clean. By first cleansing our hearts, forsaking our sins, forgiving everybody, all we ever had against them, anointing, washing the body, putting on clean and decent clothes, by anointing our heads and keeping all the commandments. This is a quote of the system that is preached at that time in establishing the church. That system carries on today. In other words, Joseph introduced a non-biblical method to the saints, a method that is still practiced now. Make yourself holy and God will accept you. Live righteously and you will earn a place with him. Live by the law, the law of rituals, the law of ordinances, the law of cleansing your heart, and you will come to know God in truth. But the Bible preaches and teaches an altogether different approach. Listen and see if you hear these verses in the LDS church and then ask yourself, why don't we? Romans 5, 8. But God commends his love towards us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Meaning, while we were sinners, his grace is afforded to us. We don't clean ourselves up. We don't make ourselves worthy for, for, uh, to be saved by him. If we could do that, we wouldn't have needed him in the first place. You can't make yourself worthy. So he, while we were even sinners, he still saved us. Galatians 2.16 Knowing that a man is not justified by the works of the law, but by faith of Jesus Christ, even we have believed in Jesus Christ that we might be justified by the faith of Christ and not by the works of the law. For by the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Okay? Romans 11:6. But if by grace, then it is no more of works. It's not saved after all that we can do. He refutes that right here. If by grace, it is no more of works. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. It's like saying, I'm pregnant or I'm not. You either are or you aren't. You're either saved by grace or you're not. It's not a combination. He's saying right here in Romans 11:6 that's an impossibility. But if it is works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. I know that's a little complicated, but he's simply saying you can't have both. Grace is an unmerited gift of Christ. Works are something that you're going to have to do yourself, and they can't come together. 2 Corinthians, last scripture, 2.19. And he said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I glory in my weakness that the power of Christ may overshadow me. You don't hear those verses in the LDS church because you are under a different system, a religious system of sanctifying yourself to be worthy of God's blessings. It's not only unbiblical, it's counter to what the essential saving principles are of saving faith. I think this quote really helps summarize something that I'm trying to say. I have this in the front of my Bible. What re religion demands, grace gives. Religion says do, grace says believe. Religion exacts, grace bestows. Religion says work, grace says rest. Religion threatens announcing with a curse. Grace entreats announcing with a blessing. Religion says do and thou shalt live. Grace says live and thou shalt do. Religion condemns the best man. Grace saves the worst man. Religion reveals the character of God and the weakness of men. Religion was never given to save. Religion was given to be our schoolmaster, our pedagogus. The law sets forth what men ought to be. Grace sets forth what God is. I love that quote. It says a lot. Okay, we're going to open up the phone lines, and uh, as we do that, 
I want to say a couple more things. Without this fallout, this alternate system of righteousness and our diligence and works or with it, what do you get? You get bondage. You get a hamster on a wheel, never knowing you're standing with God, running, 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 running. You get uncertainty. You get Prozac when you, don't, when you really shouldn't have it. It's living an I've got to kind of life rather than I get to kind of life. It's serving an I have to religion instead of I want to relationship. In conclusion, imagine that it's your wife's birthday, men out there, and you go and you know it's her birthday and you go to the store begrudgingly and you get some flowers and you go into her and you hand them to her and she says, what's this for? And you say, well, it's your birthday, isn't it? And you say, yeah, and you say, well, you know, I have to get them, don't I? And then she says, well, you don't really have to. Well, don't worry about it. They're on sale. Or don't worry about them. I picked them up from a cemetery somewhere and it didn't cost me a cent. Some, some cheesy thing like that. Let's say that you go down that road. You know, imagine how your wife feels in that kind of relationship. That relationship is called religion. Now imagine that it's not your wife's birthday and you go to the store and you pick out the most beautiful bouquet of flowers and you take them to her and you sneak up behind her and you give them to her and she says, surprise, what's this for? And you say, it's because I love you so much and I want to be with you and I'm so grateful for all the hard work that you do in my life and I just want to just praise you and thank you for everything you've done for me. That is religion. I mean, that is relationship, excuse me. Relationship over religion. I pray that we will find it. We're going to Barbara in Salt Lake City who wants to talk about blasphemy on line two. Barbara, you're on Heart of the Matter. Sean, it's so good to finally get into speak with you. Oh, I'm glad you're on. God bless you, and I am praying for you all the time and for your safety and your coming and going and in your good work. And I have a comment yes. and I have a question. Yes. My comment is this. I'm a great grandmother. Uh -huh. I have struggled with learning the truth most of my life. Mm -hmm. Ever since I was a young teenager, I have struggled with the LDS religion. Uh-huh. And I had a problem with Joseph Smith, and I had a problem with the plural marriage. And I was given different answers that the people nowadays aren't even given. Right. And I grew up being taught a lot of things differently than people are now uh -huh. in the church now. Right. And it's only fairly recently, well, there have been times when I have come close to really finding the truth. Uh -huh. And some things would come into my heart, and I would feel what I call the, the gift of tears where you just feel the kind of overcome by the Holy Spirit. And I felt that in and out of the LDS church, and I do come from people, pioneer people, and people, uh, my family have uh, artifacts in the, in the um, museum and, and right. everything. Well, Barbara, do you have a, a message to, to share with the listeners about your experience, how to summarize that for the people listening? It is very, very difficult to come to the truth, but when you do, it's exactly the way you said, Sean. Ah, oh, praise God. Praise the Lord God. Something comes over you, and there is no doubt in your mind and truth, and the light turns on. It's just like Jesus says, the light turns on, and you see the truth. You, you hear God's voice speaking into your heart, and things are being revealed to you all the time. Praise My God. question is this. Yeah. Uh, in section 132, it also says, that's in the Doctrine and Covenants, it also says that uh, blasphemy is the shedding of innocent blood. Yeah. I'll tell you, that's all news to me, but boy, have I learned the truth since since I've been born again, and, yeah. and it's just been this year that I was born again. Oh, Barbara, I love oh, your God. testimony. Thank you so much for sharing it, and uh, keep calling, and thank you for your prayers and support, Barbara. You bet, and I pray for everyone who calls you. Thanks so much. Bye -bye. God bless you. Bye-bye. You know, I want to say something about that call before we go to Casey and Holiday. Um, I, I figured out, I'm writing another book, a fiction book, but I figured out that uh, by the time a person's 19 years old, very, very conservatively, they have probably heard at least uh, 5,000 uh, 5, testimonies 
of I know the church is true. So when you get to a point where you're starting to question some things, you have a mindset that is very difficult to deal with. So you're dealing with some very tough stuff. I understand that. But the Lord can come and change your heart. And that's the, the thing that set, sets you on the road that he wants you to be on, re regardless of what that road is. So you have to really turn it to him and ask him to take over your life. But uh, there's a lot of indoctrination that goes along with being LDS. Casey, in holiday, you are on line three. And Casey, before you answer your question, if the phone lines are busy, please call back. If you're getting a recording, please call back and keep trying. Casey, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hi. Hi. Um, all I have to say um, real quick is God bless you and God bless Barbara. That is awesome testimony. That was. Um, well, two questions. One, can I get, is there any way I can get a bumper sticker that yeah. you have on the table? Hey, are you going to come to uh, the Heart in the Park? Oh, I'd love to. Well, come to that. We're going to give them out there. Awesome. Okay. Yeah. And the question I wanted to ask was, um, I was talking to someone who was LDS, and they told me that Joseph Smith was basically the final say, um, even if you did everything that you could here, to get into the celestial kingdom. Yeah. You know, I have to, I have to uh, beg ignorance here because I don't know the reference where that's said. Now, I know I've been taught that. But I can't tell you where it was said, so, but I will find out for you, and we will comment on it next uh, week. And I'll make sure that we, uh, I follow up with the questions that are asked that I don't know, and I'll give you an answer where that was said, how he is going to stand as the judge. I know it's there. I've read some, uh, actually some things from Bob Millett that say that. Uh, but I'll, uh, I'll have to find that out and give it, get it back to you. Okay. Yeah. All right, thanks for calling. Well, thank you. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. Darwin and Orem. Darwin, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, Sean. I don't even remember me. I was your... Is this, Dar is this Darwin Coker hands? It is. I Unbelievable, man. Yep. Hey, for the viewers, just to let you know, Darwin was my next door neighbor when I just got married uh, 22, 23 years ago and going to BYU. Hey, I just, I just have a couple comments for you. <laughs> I'm gonna... I have a feeling our friendly neighborly relationship's over. No, I'm not, you know, I'm not going to try to change your views, and you're definitely not going to change mine. All right, man. Just know that, you know, throughout my years in the church, I've never been taught anything else than salvation through Jesus Christ and his atonement. Right. The church has never taught anything other than that. Yeah. And that no matter what we do, if it isn't because of the grace of our Savior, we have no hope. Right. And that's where my hope lies, is in, in the atonement of my Savior. I love to hear that, Darwin. As far as the faith you're talking about, yeah. if a person has true faith in Jesus Christ, uh -huh. that faith leads to good works mm -hmm. and, a, and a trying to do those things that the Savior would have you do. No question. And then, you know, it says in the, in the Bible, faith without works is dead. So and, and it's talking about faith, our, though. Works are a part. But Darwin, it's talking about... Works are a part of what Darwin, the Savior looks at. Darwin, it's talking about faith there. It's not talking about works. You have to understand that it's faith without works is dead. It's talking about your faith and how that is manifested in your life. It's not an argument about salvation and which way you're saved. It, you're talking about faith. And yes, faith is always, but you know, you know what Paul said about it? He said in 1 Corinthians 5.10, let me read it. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace, which was toward me, has not been without fruit. Now listen to this, Darwin. But I labored more abundantly than all of them, yet not I, but the grace of God within me. I, it is the it grace was. of God that makes you work more, Darwin. Now, let me ask you this. You, I gave you your say. Let me ask you this. You say that you know you're saved only by Jesus Christ, and you've been taught that your whole life. What does saved mean to you, Darwin? Eternal life is present. You know that's not true, Darwin, because that is not true whatsoever. For to have eternal life and live in God's presence in the LDS church, faith alone does not do it. That is not true. So you're not being, you're not being fair. The church teaches that. No, it does not. What you do in this life. What you do in this life. Darwin, if it was just faith, it would be a Christian church. But what it says is, hey, you also need to be baptized. You need to have your own endowment. You need to be sealed for time and all eternity. All those things are necessary. You need to endure to the end. And then you need to live by the other laws of this land, including tithing, obeying the Sabbath day. This stuff are works, uh, Darwin. 
So what you're saying is not true. Your version of salvation is not the Christian version of salvation of eternal life with God like you just said. Now, even though I love you as a neighbor and I would help you do anything before, I uh, can't agree with you here, buddy. We're going on to Shauna. Uh, sorry, darling, call back. Shauna, line two. Yes, I, I see on the, uh, my, computer, my television yeah. a very handsome young man that's been on a mission, had a strong testimony of the Bible and the Book of Mormon, uh -huh. and Bory's testimony. Mm-hmm in a strong manner that it knew that it was true. Mm -hmm. What has changed you? Why have you let Satan come into your life? Sin changed me, Shauna. It did. Sin changed me. I just feel so sorry for your mother and your dad. You don't. You turned against what is the true religion. Yeah. The true. And if the Book of Mormon wasn't true, someone would have proved it many years ago and they'd have been a rich, rich person. Oh, Sean, I'm not going to argue with you. You sound like a sweet lady, and you called me handsome. I had some guy earlier call yeah. me a monkey. So, I mean, you're so nice. I'm going to be nice Very to you. Very nice-looking man. I'm not going to argue with you about that. I just want to tell you, Shauna, this, okay? And one of these days, my dear, Sha I know you'll come home. Shauna, let me please say this, please. Shauna, I was a very unhappy, miserable man who was duplicitous in his life. I came to know the Lord at the side of the road, and He saved me from a life of sin. I am a happy, good father and husband now that's dedicated to his life and wife and the Lord like no other. How my parents could be unhappy with the change in me, it's beyond me, and they're not. They can see that I'm a new man in Christ. And so there's, there's a difference. I know it's heartbreaking when children leave the religion of their youth. But I am a better man, Shauna, and you're just going to have to believe that. Watch the show in June when my wife might come on, and she'll testify to it, too. Oh, well, thank you, dear. You take care. Thank you. All right. Bye-bye. Thank you for your concern. Tom and Logan. Tom, you're on Heart of the Matter. Hey, Sean. How you doing? I'm doing well. How are you? Good. Um, I'm LDS, and uh, I want to say uh, on behalf of LDS people that uh, sorry about if People harass you and write you bad emails and everything, but uh, that's all right. Tom. Anyway, my my comment was uh, just piggybacking on uh, Darwin's uh, comment and James. Of course, we know it says, "What does it profit my brother, and though a man say he has faith and have not works, can faith save him?" And uh, just talking about faith a little bit about faith is. Um, knowledge that the Holy Ghost gives you about something. That's what faith is. And then that knowledge drives you to do stuff. Right. If you don't do what you need to do, then your faith is dead, like the scripture was saying. I, I agree with you. I agree with you, but but you're but you're mix you're you're throwing in a mixture here of 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 order. You're not talking about faith being the thing that promotes you, that prompts you to do the good works. You're talking about doing the good works and creating faith. And that's, and that's not possible. And that's oh, what the church teaches. If you do good until you believe enough, and then you're, then you're justified. That's not how it works. No, the faith, the faith creates you to, to, to do the works. And not just talking about, okay, charity, let's give money to the poor. That's not the work. Right. It works right. It's things that Jesus said to do. Like, okay. endure to the end and you'll be saved. Right. You must be born again and you'll right. be saved. It uh, is faith that does that. The other one is about repentance. Uh, godly sorrow worketh repentance to salvation and so there's all these different things that it's true I agree with you don't understand I'm agreeing with you the problem is, <laughs> is yes, church teaches. no they don't because what they don't teach is that Jesus is the the modus operandi in which you work it is Jesus that guides you it is Jesus that changed your heart from being a sinner to being saved and it is Jesus that operates within you and dwells in you to do the good that you do they do not teach that. They teach the program ahead of the Lord. And, and we can argue, we can go back and forth. It's going to be a difference. But let me also say, I have yet to meet a Christian, a true believing Christian, who does not believe in works. This is, this is, this is a total misunderstanding, if not a falsehood. I'm not saying you're giving me a falsehood. But, Christ, but Mormons always say, oh yeah, just say you're saved by faith and just go off and sin like there's no tomorrow. That's the biggest lie I've ever heard. 
I have never known a Christian to say, oh, Jesus saved me, and I'm just going to go off and fornicate and do whatever I want. If they do say that, yes, I would question their Christianity seriously. But the ones I know, the people that I've been tutored under, they believe in James. Believe in it completely, and so do I. But what motivates you to do that work? It's the Spirit guiding you. It's Jesus and Him giving you a new life. Have you been born again? Yes, of course. How, when did that happen? Explain it to me. Okay, when, you're, when you want to uh, turn your life over to God, you, you have to gain a testimony, or in other words, of what? a faith in Jesus, or gain that knowledge through the Holy Ghost, and that, and that Spirit, the Spirit of Jesus, leads you to come into the church and be born again through baptism. Wait, That's wait, you're talking about an eight-year-old here right now. That's right. Okay, come, you know what? You're talking about but before they're eight, they have no age of accountability according to LDS doctrine. They have no mm. idea of how to think. And now you're saying they have to come through all these processes, get baptized, and accept the church, and then they experience rebirth. I'm saying that an eight-year-old can be sensitive to the Spirit. You know what? Know that he's doing it. This, is, look at, and, 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 and then we can go down the road of what is salvation to you, and, and then it comes down to none of this really pertains to a biblical understanding of salvation by grace. It's you, all in the Bible right there, all of those scriptures. Of course it is. I just said that. I said what you're saying does not match up with the Bible. And I just said it does. I know you did. Because of all the scriptures about baptism, repentance, yeah. faith, and it's every single thing that the church teaches. Temple endowment? What? Yeah, temple endowment. Sure. Yeah, right. That's in there. All right. Uh, married for time and all eternity? Yes. Yeah, that's it. You, what you're doing is now you're hurting your argument by showing that you're not being fair and truthful. You know that the, the, uh, the endowment... You know that all those things that are in there were done away with if you believe in the Bible, and you know that the temple ordinances and rites and rituals are not part of biblical Christianity, and you know that they're extra biblical and that they are important to salvation and exaltation being a Mormon. So you're arguing something to try to show that you, you really believe this, but in practice it is not the case. I'm sorry, and, and we can just go back and you can say, but this scripture, that, it's, just, it's just not true. And, and, and if you really look at it, you know it. Your own prophet, did you, if you watched the last week's show, he said we don't believe in the biblical Christi uh, Christ that the Christians believe in today. We believe in the new one. Read Bushman's book. You'll be amazed. Read Dan Vogel's book about Joseph and what he proposed as the new gospel. You're, you're, what you're doing is you're saying what you believe to be true, but you're not giving me what the doctrine and practice truly is. Of I'm, course, of course, I can give you all these scriptures, and guess what? You're going to be like, oh, you see, that actually means this. In every single scripture, I can say that means what we believe, and then you'll be like, oh, no, well, you're not interpreting that no, right. No, no, I mean, I just asked you two simple questions about, about the temple and endowments and salvation and exaltation. I asked Darwin the same thing about what is salvation, what does it mean to be saved, and he said it means living with God, and that he said it's all uh, by faith and grace. That's absolutely not true in the LDS church, and if you're trying to say that, I think the, the, the BYU professors are rolling over on their chairs right now saying, just, shut up, dude, you're not being truthful. No, it just said what we were saying, faith and grace. Okay, faith incorporates all of those works. That's what I'm trying to say. I agree, I agree uh, faith incorporates those works, but I don't believe that it's faith in Jesus Christ and his atonement. I believe it's faith in an institution and the, and the model that they've given you for salvation, which is different than Jesus Christ. We got to end. I've been on too long with it, but thank you. I, I like it. And keep calling and, and let's talk it through. All right, let's go to Laura and Holiday. Laura. Hi, Sean. Um, Hi. Thanks so much for taking my call. You're um, welcome. Just real quick comment. I'm a Christian, and I just want to say to LDS people that for those struggling just about the truth and worried about rejection of your family, just hang on, and God will provide you with an awesome fa sorry, family in Him and just. I know it's scary to leave something you've known your whole life, and probably all the relatives are there, but, you know, if God is, is leading you in truth, just hold on, you know? Right. And so also I have a quick question. Yes. Um, I've, I've come recently to understand that, like, when I talk to my LDS friends, they say we believe in the Bible, but I think it's, well, what, my inter what I finally understood is that, like, as a Christian, the Bible is the authority to right. me. Like, whatever it says. 
if I'm if I think one way, the Bible says something. I, that's I have to agree with it. Right. And when I, my question is, when I approach some LDS people and they say we believe in the Bible, and what what's the best way to approach them? Like if I'm showing them something out of the Bible that's incorrect with what their thinking is, knowing that it's not a book of authority to them. Well, uh, the problem is you can show them a lot of scriptures that talk about the Word of God and the washing of the Word and, uh, and everything else that comes along with believing in the Bible, but they aren't going to accept it because they don't believe the Bible has any authority. They believe that the, the, the authority comes through men, through priesthood authority. Okay. They also believe that the Bible, you probably know this, is, as far as it's translated correctly, they believe it. Right. And Joseph Smith went through the entire thing. So that Bible they carry around, though it's a King James Version, has many of uh, passages altered by Joseph Smith to give you the correct inspiration that he received of what it was truly supposed to say. Of course, it supports their theology of, of, of truth. So when they say they believe the Bible, they believe their version of it, and they believe in it literally and selectively, meaning they will go through like our earlier callers have done, and they'll say faith without works is dead. They don't take it. They don't take the Bible as a whole exegetically, meaning not reading into it, but just reading what's there. And they have a very poor human, hermeneutic, which means their understanding of what the Bible really means. Mm -hmm. So what I would do is I would just say, let's not talk about the Bible and its authority because I, in my experience, and this is just me, it hasn't been effective. I would talk about Jesus and sin. Okay. I would talk to them about, do they have a relationship with Jesus based on being spiritually reborn? Because Jesus gave the imperative, you must be reborn, born again. And I would say, are you a sinner? Mm -hmm. And I would say, how are you reconciling your sin? Where is that going? Right. And then examine that. Okay. All right. Awesome. Keep it up. All right. Thanks for your support. and Keep watching. Hey, come to uh, Heart in the Park. Okay. All right, man. Thanks. Bye. Take care. Bye. Robert on line one. Robert from Murray. Hi, son. Hey, how's it going? Hey, yeah. Uh, I've had kind of your similar experience, you know, the conversion. Uh -huh. Very powerful experience. But I was, I didn't become LDS. I wasn't, I wasn't raised it. Uh huh. But um, I came from a different religion. But people I know that are LDS, LDS question the validity of it. They say if it's from the devil, uh, yeah. interpreted emotions. Do you have, how, if you, do they do that to you, and how do you, you know, respond to that? Because it's really offensive. Yeah, it is. I experience and then have them, you know, dismiss it as not legitimate. Yeah, my brother uh, said it was a psychological response <laughs> and that it was uh, also evil. Yeah. Um, the only thing I can do is what Jesus said, and it's by your fruits. And all I can do is show my life and how I treat them. Now, this is terrible to say, but here on television, I, I fail that test quite frequently. <laughs> uh, but I can show you what I was and yeah. what I am today, and the people who know me and question that, um, that is the only thing I can offer. I tell you, it's tough, though, because you do everything right. Yeah. Half a cup of coffee, and you're beneath them. How do you, what do you do about that? That's uh, terrible. I, I love them, and it is terrible. And I can't imagine what you go through here in, uh, in Murray uh, yeah. trying to do. I have no idea. But I strengthen yourself, read the word pray, and hang on, brother. I don't know. Okay. Yeah, I'm sorry. Thank you very much. Okay, take care. Bye-bye. All right, we are going to go to some questions. Uh, Douglas in Salt Lake City said, is a Mormon becoming born again, putting the cart before the horse? Can this really happen without them first rejecting all their false doctrine? In my own experience, Douglas, I uh, came to know the Lord as a Mormon, believing in the Mormon God, believing in the uh, Mormon ontology of God, the makeup of God, separate and distinct individuals, physical God. I believed in Jesus at the side of the road only as I was taught as he was as a Mormon, and the Lord miraculously changed my heart. In time, many, many years later, I, I walked from Mormonism as he opened my eyes to the Word and things like that. So I think there are a couple methods of trying to reach Latter-day Saints, and I think they're all effective. I think countercult ministries do a good job at helping them, searching Mormons, see what is really going on, and it helps them come out. But I think for active Mormons who are looking for something more, to introduce them to the Lord, it's not necessary to extract them first 
and get them to understand all the problems with it. I think that it can happen through Jesus. And that's what our ministry is about, is helping Jesus, the Latter-day Saints know Jesus and let him do the work in their life. And that's why I say in the show, I don't really mind. I mean, that's not up to me. If someone decides to stay in the church after being reborn, they're going to do that. But in time, the Lord will direct them where he wants them to go. That's up to him. I leave that up to him and not me. The other thing is, I don't think we can limit God. I think it's impossible to try to say, God, you can't do that with a Mormon. You can't, they can't come to know Jesus as a Mormon. I mean, that's impossible. They have to know about Joseph. And I, I just refuse to limit God. So he miraculously changed me. He can miraculously change other people. Uh, Crystal and Leighton says Mormons don't focus on the negative, make negativity of Jesus' death. They focus on the positive, i.e. what was taught, the resurrection and his power. They don't like to think of it as suffering. That's depressing. I want you to know that the Bible teaches that the cross is not negativity, but the cross is a joy and a, and a, and a, and a blessing to all of mankind. And so uh, in human terms, humanistic terms, I could see you categorizing it as a negative event. It is horrible, true. But it, ge it gave so much to the world that it is viewed as a positive in that light. And that's how Christians see it, as a positive that changes them and gives them new life. We're going to go to Christopher in Taylorsville in just a minute. But uh, quickly, Jessica was wondering what church I recommend in Ogden. I haven't visited a church in Ogden. So I would recommend you go to standingtogether.org, www.standingtogether.org. And um, they have a number of churches in Ogden that they recommend. Um, and I'll get to these others later. We're going to Christopher on line two. Christopher, you're on Heart of the Matter. How are you doing? Hey, good. How are you? Not too bad. Mm -hmm. I overheard your comment about the, quote, faith without works pertains yeah. to solely having faith and not having works. I have to say that uh, the quote about faith without works being dead. Yeah. I spoke of a man being born of water and spirit. Yeah. What is your outtake on that? Well, the, the water uh, throughout the scriptures is known as the scripture, the washing of the word by the water. The, and the washing of the word is, is the water. So when you're born again, you're born again by the spirit and the water. I also view that because Jesus follows that verse up by saying, um, that which is born of the flesh is flesh. Are you there, Christopher? Yeah. Yeah. Got to hang that up. Someone's got to hang that up. Uh, that which is born of flesh is flesh. So I, I view that as the first birth. And that which is born of spirit is spirit. I tell you, you must be born again. Those are two different ways I've read uh, it being interpreted. But I believe that uh, whenever it's referring to water, I actually believe it's talking about the Word of God. The Word of God being the water, the one with yep, the... that washes us and cleans us. Or no. read it, yeah. Then, uh, what did you... According to that, what would your outtake be on John the Baptist's baptism? The, the baptism of John the Baptist was uh, the baptism for the Jews. And he, his was to go about and baptize them. But remember, he said, my baptism, uh, someone's going to come along and he's going to baptize you with fire. And, and that's coming along later. But we're doing this water baptism now to prepare you for repentance. Remember, he went through and said, repent ye, repent ye. His was a call to repentance. And when they repented the Jews, they could symbolize, hey, I've repented. I'm going to be baptized. Also, it was the way that Jews converted people. If people wanted to convert to, to Judaism, they would be baptized. That was his call. The third thing about that was that uh, John had to baptize Jesus. He had to because he was looking for the one. And it was part of his mission to baptize that one. And so when he did and the spirit descended like a dove, he knew I have baptized that Messiah that we are looking for. So the baptism of John was very different than the baptism of the spirit that we read about in Acts. Well, what was, then if you're the Messiah's quote to John or is uh, saying John was, it is up to us to fulfill all things good. John said to the Messiah that he needed to be baptized of the Messiah, but instead, but also the Messiah went ahead and told him it is up to us to fulfill all things. Sure, and he had to fulfill that. It was part of his thing. He, he was going to fulfill everything that was going on, so there was no, no question as to what he was doing in his ministry. He fulfilled everything he needed to fulfill. Another thing to consider is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and, and Acts up to chapter 2 were all parts, essentially, of the Old Testament. Jesus was there preaching to the, to the Jews. It wasn't until his ascension and the Spirit fell that, that the Old Testament was essentially ended and we go into the real new covenant, the New Testament. So the practice of John and baptism was something for the Jews. Now, understand, I believe in baptism and I think it's a very important thing for Christians to be baptized. 
but it is not a saving ordinance because if it was, a baptismal font would be next to the cross. Why do you say the cross? Because the cross is where salvation comes, faith on him who died for us. Then what is your comment about the saying, bearing the cross, let he who would follow me and carry his cross? Yeah, I talked about that last week on show 12. And you know what? A lot of questions, good ones. I appreciate it. Keep watching. I got to go to Danny in Salt Lake City. Danny on line three. Uh, yeah, Sean. Um, the way I've uh, had it explained to me uh, between the, the James passage and the Romans, like Romans chapter 4, Abraham was justified by faith and faith alone. Yeah. And uh, it's, because, it's because God can see your faith apart from works. Yeah. And when you look at the James passage, the James passage in context is talking about that man cannot see your faith apart from works. That you have to have works in order for man to be able to have, so your testimony can be seen by men. Uh -huh. Men cannot see your faith apart from works. I see. And I believe that the context of James compared to Romans chapter 4, that the most important thing with LDS people that I have, I've had a hard time with is try to show them that in Romans chapter 4, uh -huh. justification before God is by faith and faith alone apart from works. Right. And your justification before man or being a witness to mankind, trying to show them that you are a Christian, James is saying that you're not a Christian to them until they can see your works. That's a fantastic uh, explanation. Fantastic. I love it. You know what? Another thing to consider is I believe in the inspiration of the, of the men who put the Bible together. If you look at the, uh, the first, uh, you look at um, uh, Acts and the Romans and, and First and Second Corinthians, the order, uh, Acts and, uh, I mean, Romans and First and Second Corinthians, Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, all of those preach grace. And as you continue on down, you start to get toward the other ones. They start preaching works. And there's a, there's a system to that to show that first you believe in God and then you come to that. And I really believe that the people who put our Bible together had that in mind when they did it. Exactly. That's a great insight, Guy. I really appreciate that one. Okay. Uh, on this uh, uh, thing that's going on in the park, yeah. is can you get in touch with people on how to get in, in more involved in ministry to LDS people you know, and become more involved? Sure. Okay. You mean at the park? Yes, sir. Yeah, we'll do it. Thank you. All right, man. I'll see you then. Bye. Take care. Bye-bye. Uh, Chris and Tuilla. Hey, Catholics rule. <laughs> Catholics rule, huh? Well, they have ruled the world. I agree with that. Are you there? Oh, Chris, you hung up on me, man. I was just having fun with you. I, I didn't mean that, so I hope that didn't hurt your feelings. All right, we're waiting to go through some more operators. All the lines are busy. Call back. We only have about uh, six minutes. Uh, from Jacqueline wants to know, how can someone practicing temple work, believing they will become a god, still be saved? I, uh, I do not make it my job to decide who will be saved and who won't be. I don't know what motivates people. Some people who go to do that temple work have been taught cradle to grave to do it. I don't know. I know that if they have been regenerated by the Lord and they trust and have faith in Him, that they will be saved. I don't know uh, how God's going to handle all that, but you know, a lot of different people do a lot of different things in the name of religion and faith. I'm not going to uh, uh, ostracize the LDS because of practices that I don't agree with, and I don't agree with them. I think that the problem with the practices mostly is not so much as far as salvation, but the bondage that it puts them in here in this life, but that's a side uh, comment. Please don't uh, email me and call me wrong. Jesus is the way. The more of those practices that are done away with, the better. Stacy in Bountiful on line two. Stacy, you're on Heart of the Matter. Oh, hi, Sean. I actually talked to you earlier today, and I'm LDS, and hi. I asked you what the definition of being born again was, and I think that would be helpful since you seem to have a lot of LDS callers, and they don't explain that definition okay. in the LDS church. You know, maybe if you just said that quickly, you know, okay. for the other LDS people who were, you know, born and raised LDS and aren't familiar with that term because okay. I think it's confusing. You are, know, are, you, are you watching on TV? I am, yes. Let, let me I, answer again. I'm going to hang up from it to open a line and let me answer it from here. Okay, great. Can I say one comment yeah. real quick? Yeah. Um, oh, I just felt I really appreciated when you said you became a better person after you had your conversion to yeah. born-again Christianity. Yeah. And 
I agree that God gives people what they need. And, yeah. you know, I, my sister joined a different church and was definitely a better person right. after that. And I think God just gives people what they need when they need it. And, you know, we, I, I do think God talks to people of all faiths and, mm-hmm. you know, well, you know, and um, I felt really bad about Robert who said someone from the LDS church had said his testimony was from Satan and I want him to know all people all the LDS people don't believe that. That's beautiful, Stacy. <laughs> Thanks so much. Oh, well, thank you for your time, and you have a wonderful night, and God bless you God and bless you. all the people that work with you. Thanks so much, Stacy. Thanks. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. What a gracious uh, lady, Stacy. Uh, she wants to know me to explain rebirth, and I'm going to do that quickly. Uh, it is on show two, I believe. But uh, Christians believe that the Bible teaches... Uh, Christians know the Bible teaches that we are born in sin, that we are all sinners, and that when we come into this world, we are, have a sin nature. Now, it doesn't mean babies sin because they're not accountable. They don't know what it is, but they have a sin nature about them, a selfish sin nature, a my, my, my sin nature. And until they uh, have a new spirit, they're going to continue in that nature, even if it's m- molded toward being right outwardly. And so Jesus said to Nicodemus, what must I do to inherit the kingdom of God? And he said, you, you must be born again. And, and we believe that that is a, an imperative. And so you go to the Lord and you ask him to take over your life, forgive you of your sin. You accept Jesus into your heart and you say, please change my life. And it changes the state that you're in from having a sinful heart and a sinful spirit to being given a new heart, like Samuel was, and a new spirit by which to operate by. That's the first phase of spiritual rebirth. The second phase is sanctification. Now, while we are sanctified by Jesus' righteousness, we also are sanctified through the process of our life. The LDS Church is very good at at the sanctification part of a life. They do very well at help mold people and get them to do, make correct choices and support groups and everything like that. However, in, in my opinion, they put the sanctification part first and foremost, and they ignore the part of spiritual rebirth, having the Jesus experience. That is so vital because that is what gives you new life and new hope and it takes you off the hamster wheel. Instead, you're off that wheel and you're running free in a meadow the size of the earth. It's a great experience. So there is spiritual rebirth and there is coming to know Jesus as your Savior and living for Him. And there is spiritual sanctification that comes along with that. And finally, there's ultimate resurrection and that's the final phase of it, three parts of spiritual regeneration. I hope that made sense, and if not, we'll cover it again. We're going to Seth. You have one minute, Seth, on Heart of the Matter. Okay. Um, you said it yourself, not so many words, but uh, you said that uh, God wants everybody to be a certain way, correct? In, in so many words. <laughs> I don't know. I don't even know what you mean by that. He wants us all to be the same. You know, maybe the same? He wants... No, he made us all very, very diverse. Right, exactly. So... Maybe he wants some people to be Mormons. He wants some people to be Baptists, some people to be Lutheran, or what have you. Well, how about Buddhists? How about atheists? How far do you want to go? Murderers. I mean, where do you stop? Where does the diversity of God stop? Where does it? It doesn't, does it? That, see, and that's called universalism, and that's completely takes Jesus out of the picture and makes him unnecessary. So I won't do that for my testimony of the Lord because it's just not possible. But it's an it's a interesting thought. we got to go on. <laughs> Claudia, I'm sorry. Claudia, uh, you're on Heart of the Matter. you got one minute. Hi. Um, you served an LDS mission, right? Yeah. Um, I just have one question for you. And I just have one answer. You do, huh? <laughs> um, why, if you served an LDS mission, you brought so many people into the gospel on your LDS mission, you now are trying to lead so many people away from the LDS faith. Yeah. Claudia, uh, I, was, I was 19 years old and I had been taught that I hope they call me on a mission from the time I was a boy. Uh, all my friends went on LDS missions and I, you know, I was 19. I was taught this cradle to my 19th year of what truth was. I never had an opportunity to look outside of it. It was, it was a social con- uh, conformity that I adhered to which most LDS 19-year-olds do. Now, I'm not saying all of them do. Some of them truly believe, and you get out there and you start believing more and more. But, you know, 
it was uh, something I did out of social pressure, out of believing I was supposed to, that the prophet called me to, that I was doing what was right. But when I came to know the Lord, that 19-year-old man died. That 19-year-old man was a lustful, arrogant, fighting. Even though I could put a suit on and share the gospel for two years, I was an idiot. And the Lord changed my heart at 37 years of age, and I became the man he wanted me to be. So what I did as a 19, 20 year old out in Pennsylvania, you know, I did under the auspices of what I was taught from a boy. And what I'm doing now is what the Lord taught me and has taught me to do. And that's why, Claudia. Oh, well, um, I, um, I was born again of Jesus, but uh -huh. I was born again of Jesus when I found the LDS religion. Well, you know, I would love for you to call back and talk to us about that, but we're out of time right now. Will you do that? I sure will. Okay, thank you. We're out of time, everybody. If you're still calling, uh, just want to thank you for your calls. I want to uh, remind you that uh, you can get the book, Born Again Mormon, at uh, www.bornagainmormon.com. We're having a heart in the park. We hope you can make it. LDS are invited. Let's have a, uh, a worship session. If you're LDS and you haven't been born again, you want to stay LDS. You want to continue on with your LDS thing, but you want to know what spiritual rebirth is about. Come to Heart in the Park. We're going to have a worship. We're going to have a step forward, and I'll lead you through a simple prayer. Do it publicly. He suffered for you publicly. Take him into your heart publicly, and you will see your life change in ways like no other. See you next week on Heart of the Matter. I'm on a ride, going nowhere I am an existential cowboy on the wind And I won't be coming out, I'm going in This man's awake a storm's arising, the dawn's awaiting till a hundred.